And now it's time for Power of Prophecy with your host, former professor at the University of Texas at Austin, career United States Air Force officer, and best-selling author, Tex Mars. Hello, friends. This is Tex Mars. Welcome to another edition of Power of Prophecy. Coming to you from Austin, Texas. Hey, we've got a great subject for today. In fact, we're going to continue it next week, depending on how we do today. But I think it's going to take two sessions and because it's it's just so much fun. It, it, it is great fun. We're going to study the Word of God today. And listen, here are 10 scriptures. That this is what I'm going to talk about now. And this is why it's so much fun. It's 10 scriptures that you will almost never hear preached in churches today. Now, you know, pastors, they can have PhDs, DDs, and all kinds of letters after their names. Uh, that They can go to these Bible schools and theology schools and so forth. And, and if you're not one of these religious kind, then you can be a professor. And, you know, I, I've taught at, at, let's see, at least three universities I can remember. Golden Gate University in San Francisco. Then, of course, uh, uh, Park University in Kansas City. And I've taught at the University of Texas at Austin. And I met hundreds of professors and doctors. And most of them were sort of, well, <laughs> shall I say it? Dear friends, they were ignoramuses, certainly about the Bible. They knew nothing. And and, and that's true of most people in, in the world today. You'll go to a church and you'll sit in that pew for 20 or 30 or 40 years and never hear one of these topics broached. But yet, the, 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 these 10 scriptures that you're going to hear about today, that we're going to study together as friends, they're so important. I mean, these are, these contain the seeds of geopolitical ideas. That's right. It has to do with your life, your neighbor's lives, maybe this country, maybe the whole world. Everything is influenced by the, the Bible, you see. And if you leave out these scriptures, these 10 scriptures that we're going to talk about here, you've left out the glue. You, you, you know, can, can you imagine buying a book? And have you ever, I've had books like that. And the, the spine seems to be a little weak. The glue is not good. It just comes apart. You can't hold it together. Well, that's the way these verses are. Now, preachers don't study them, and there's a reason why. You're going to find out. They hate these scriptures. They can't. They, they don't even want to talk about them. I mean, it, when I get around pastors, I bring up one of these. These I, I'll quote one of these scriptures. And their eyes glass over. Whoop. They're, they're like aliens from outer space. They don't even know what I'm talking about. They can't imagine. Is that, you, you know, Wanda and I, we were in, I think it was Tennessee, at a big Baptist church. The guy, the following year, by the way, he became the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. And, and she was talking about a certain topic. And he said, is that in the Bible? She said, well, yes, it is. It's in Jeremiah. It's also in Amos, and he says, really, that's in the Bible. Oh, oh, oh okay. He didn't even know. Then I, I, I was at, over at a friend's house, and there was a, a pastor of a large Bible church, and the guy had been a professor of, of religious theology at a, at a big seminary. And I mentioned one of these verses, and he says, that's not in the Scriptures, is it? I said, yeah, well, yes, it is. It's a very important part of the scriptures. Well, I've never studied it. And, you know, I I teach at the, at the seminary, or I did teach. And, you know, I'm 50 years old. I've never heard of that. Well, that's to your detriment, pal. <laughs> I'm sorry you don't read the Bible. You don't study all the Bible, only the parts the seminary approves, I guess. That's the problem. There's certain parts that are not approved by the authorities. Mm. Did you know that? Oh, they, they'll print them, but they won't, they won't talk about them at all. No, we can't talk about that. We're going to talk about another subject. And they'll talk about the same thing over and over. And it gets to be old, old hat. You know how it is. You go to a Baptist church, I have three points for you to know today. And you know, there are three points that you studied a thousand times. These today are going to be new to you. You're going to like this. 
It's going to be fun for you. Because I believe we need to know about not only the pages, but the glue that holds them together. Now, the Bible says in Daniel 12, verse 10, that in the last days, it, it, it says right in the last days, the wicked shall do wickedly. Well, yeah, we know that. And none of the wicked will understand. Well, they won't even understand. They, they'll think they're doing right. They'll, they'll think man's way is the right way. This is God's way. Oh, yes. And think about that. And none of the wicked will understand. They won't understand. They won't know that it's wicked. But it says the wise shall understand. What does it take to be wise? Well, <laughs> let's talk about that for just a moment. What does it take for you to be wise? you got to have faith in Jesus Christ. You have faith in Jesus Christ. He comes into your heart. You're saved. Thank God. And then something great happens. The Bible says no man needs to teach you, but the Holy Spirit will instruct you in all things. Oh, boy. You see, God appoints for you, for you, my friends. I don't care whether your your name is Jack or Jim or, or Sally or <laughs> Kimberly, whatever it is. Think about that. God appoints a holy instructor just for you, the Holy Spirit. Who's a better instructor than the Holy Spirit? Nobody. Nobody anywhere. You see, I just don't understand this Bible. It's so complex. Well, ask the Holy Spirit to help you. He's right there. And he's going to instruct you in all things. That's why we're going to study these verses today. These scriptures that, that the, the pastors, many of them don't dare even touch these. Think about that. You know, uh, I was listening to Dr. MacArthur from out in California some years ago, and he said that he met uh, Dr. Robert Schuller, the Crystal Cathedral, met him on an aircraft. They were going on the same flight together. So he sat down by Dr. Schuller. So there was Dr. MacArthur and Dr. Schuller, and they began to talk about religious things. So Dr. MacArthur, John MacArthur, said, well, what do you think about, and he mentioned something in the Bible prophecy in the book of Revelation. And Schuller said, you know, I don't go there. I never studied Revelation. You cannot understand Revelation. Nobody really understands Revelation. <laughs> Whoa! Nobody understands Revelation. I don't go there, said Dr. Schuller. Is that true? Is that why so many people don't teach from, the Re from Revelation? Well, I agree with the Dr. Schuller. He cannot understand the natural man, that is the unsaved man, does not know the things of God. But you can know them. You can be wise. How much education do you need? From men, zero. Uh-oh. Did you hear what I just said? You need no instruction from men. You can get down in, in, in a cave somewhere. And... and <laughs> In Pakistan, or I don't know, you, you can go up to the top of the Rocky Mountains. You're the only one there except the Holy Spirit. Oh, yes. The Holy Spirit will instruct you in all things. Now, there's the key, my friends. Just ask the Holy Spirit to instruct you. And he's always helped me out. And it's interesting that I've studied a verse 10 or 12 times, and I just don't seem to get it. Then I go over to 13th time, let's say, and bingo, it's there. It's all in my head. I understand it all. I know how it relates with this chapter in this book and that this chapter and that book in the Bible. Everything just comes together. You see, it's precept by precept. Remember that in the Old Testament? <laughs> That's how you learn the Bible, precept by precept. Well, God knows that I, I was just a baby Christian. And he was going to teach me. He knew I wasn't ready for that yet. I wasn't ready for the greater knowledge. And the Bible is full of mysteries and, and facts that we can't really figure out. We need instructor. And God has appointed you. <laughs> what a gift God gives you. You've got the Holy Spirit who will instruct you in all things. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I mean, really, <laughs> it's just great, isn't it? Many people tell me, I just can't understand the Bible. I start reading and fall asleep. Okay. Well, then I ask the Holy Spirit, don't let me fall asleep. <laughs> Keep me awake. <laughs>
ask and ye shall receive, right? That's what it says in the Bible. Well, we're going to talk about this today, some things. The first scripture we're going to talk about, you're going to get confused on. If you haven't heard it before, I don't think I've even preached it myself in quite a while here in the ministry, but let's see if we can get to it, okay? It's in Galatians chapter 4, verse 20. We're going to go all the way to 31, 20 to 31 here. And yeah, get your get your Holy Spirit caps on. There's no such thing, of course. Ask the Holy Spirit, in other words, to, to come in your, your heart and your mind. And think about these things. Now, you, you, you know the old story, don't you? In, in, the, in uh, back in Genesis and Abraham uh, and his wife, Sarah, but she was an older woman and she couldn't have a baby, a boy. And he, he and she wanted to have this child, this son. So he, he had his concubine, you know, his servant, right? The slave, Hagar. And she had his baby. Mm hmm. And it, it's interesting. That Sarah had Isaac and that Hagar had her own child. But Hagar was a bond woman. She was a slave, wasn't she? What we have to understand, of course, is that Hagar, being the slave woman, was eventually cast out of the household. She was, let's just say, cast out of the kingdom. Abraham sent her out into the desert with her son. But God had promised Sarah a son, but she was very old. She didn't think it was possible. That's why she wanted Hagar to have, you know, Abraham's son. But then at an advanced a later age, Sarah had a son too. Well, Sarah didn't want Hagar and her son to have the promise. She was afraid that Abraham might give the promise, you know, to Hagar's son. And Hagar was the bondwoman. She was the slave girl. So Sarah sent her out of the house into the desert where she lived. And, you know, historians say today, many historians in the Middle East, say that from Hagar and her son came the entire Arab race we see today. All the Arabs, millions and millions of Arabs, have Hagar as their mother. Hmm. But all the Jews have Sarah. Now they have the same father. So Abraham had two sons. Do you get that, my friends? Two sons. And one says that physically the Arabs are the race that, of, of Hagar and her son. The slave woman. The bond. But Sarah was given a promise. And God kept his promise to her. She did have a son. Isaac. The son through promise. Now keep that in mind. And now we're going to study about these two sons, these two mothers. And guess what, friends? It relates to Israel today, to the Jews today, to everyone who is born of Jesus Christ today. Because that's what Galatians is all about. The seed of Jesus, the, the spiritual seed. So let's start reading here. It says, verse 20 says, I, this is Paul speaking now to the Galatians, people of Galatia. He says, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? See, some of them were perverting the church. They were saying, we still have to obey the law. We're Christians, but we have to obey the law. And Paul had already said, you know, I, I, I worry about you up in, uh, verse 9, he says, How turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereupon you desire again to be in bondage? Do you want to be in bondage? You observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. He's basically saying, you know, you, you, want, you want all these feast days. You want all these holy days of the Jews. But God has given you freedom. Now, that's another <laughs> another. A sermon, but you understand, they wanted to be back under the law. Said, yes, we're Christians, but we have to obey the law. Really? Not so. He says, tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written, now listen to this, friends, very careful. <laughs> it is written that Abraham had two sons 
The one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. Hagar and Sarah. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Now, this is important. Hagar's son was born after the flesh. But Sarah's son, Isaac, was by promise of God. Oh, yes, my friends. Listen, listen to me, my friend. This is the world we're talking about here. Everybody is born of the flesh. All the way from Adam and Eve. But there are those who are chosen by God who are by promise. And that's what God is talking about here. He who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Verse 24 says, Which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants. Oh my goodness gracious. For these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth, that's leadeth, to bondage, which is Hagar. What God is talking about there, sure, it did happen. There were, there were human beings named, you know, Abraham and Sarah and, 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 and Hagar and the, and the two sons. But more than that, this is an allegory. What is an allegory? It explains something. It's an example. And, and, you know, the United States is, is both a free nation, but an allegory too. We're like a pattern, a template. Do you understand what God is saying? He's saying these things are an allegory for these are the two covenants. Hagar and her son and Sarah and her son are different. There's two covenants. There's the covenant, yes, given Abraham, the law, the law, and then there's the covenant of Jesus Christ by promise. If you are free, my friends, you have Jesus Christ covenant. But if you're in bondage, you're under the law, then you've got to obey the law. Then you're of Hagar. That's the two covenants. That's what, that's what God is talking. You see, the whole Bible, the Holy Spirit is, is, is instructing us. You went back and you read in Genesis about this case. It didn't talk about the two covenants. They didn't exist at the time. But now we have these two covenants. The old covenant, which is vanishing, the Bible says, is no good anymore. It's been replaced by the new covenant. Many Christians I meet today say, well, we still have the old covenant and the Jews can be saved under the old covenant. Well, let's just see here if they can. The Jews don't need our, our new covenant of Jesus Christ. The blood of Christ, they don't need that. They're saved under the old covenant. Really? Well, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. This is, this is the two covenants. Well, let's talk about these two covenants. One gendereth, one leads to bondage, but one <laughs> is free. Now, here we go. 25. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. Uh-oh. So let's look at the children of Agar. Hagar. The slave, the bondsmaid, her child was born after the flesh. That relates, it says here, to Jerusalem, to the Jews, to Israel, to the household of Israel. That's in bondage. It's the Jerusalem that is now, that now is. In other words, even during Paul's time, it existed. The Jews who crucified Jesus, who refused to believe in the covenant of Jesus Christ, the blood, of the New Testament. They're in bondage. Answer, if he said, that relates to or corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. If you don't know Jesus Christ, my friends, you're after the flesh. And, and you don't have the promise. You don't have the Holy Spirit within you. You don't have Jesus in your heart. And you are in bondage. You may not think you're in bondage. You may think you're free. Got a newspaper today. From the Free Thinkers Association of America. Oh, yes. They're all a bunch of atheists. We're free thinkers. That's what the atheists call themselves. That's what Eliphas Levi 
the Satanist and call himself a free thinker. That's what Anton LaVey, the head of the Church of Satan in the 60s and 70s, called himself a free thinker. Oh, yes. They're in bondage. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you're in bondage to the world, to Satan. And that's, that was the fact here about Hagar, whose child was born after the flesh, not according to the promise. And, 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 and that corresponds to Jerusalem and the Jews who had not Jesus, who rejected Jesus, who said, we will not have this man to rule over us, crucify him. They're in bondage with, with, with their children. So people say to me, Israel today, Israel is of Abraham and Sarah. You can trace their heritage all the way back to Abraham and Sarah and Isaac. They're of Isaac. No, 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 they're not. No, no. Let's continue to read here. Verse 26 says, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free. <laughs> which is the mother of us all. He's speaking to Christians here. The Jerusalem, which is above, that's in heaven, heavenly Jerusalem, <laughs> not earthly Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem is free. It's not born after the flesh. You're born of the spirit. You're born of Jesus Christ, which is the mother of us all, all Christians. Jerusalem, the heavenly city, you're a citizen of that. <laughs> the commonwealth of Jerusalem and Israel, the commonwealth in heaven. You don't have anything to do with this earthly Israel. It's earthly Jerusalem. That's Sodom and Egypt, it says in Revelation. You don't want that. You don't want to be a citizen of Sodom and Egypt. Read Revelation 9 through 12. It's, 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 that's where the beast comes up out of the earth. Horrible things happen there. But listen, my friends. The Jews are indeed of Hagar. No, no, Tex. They're, uh, they're, they're of the old covenant. Now, that was Abraham and Sarah and, and they have the promise. They don't have the promise. The promise is Jesus Christ. Oh, no, their promise is they'll have the land. Oh. Oh, yes, God gave them that land for their heritage. That's why the Jews have the land of Israel today. Oh, I see. The children born after the flesh, not the spirit, not after the promise, did receive a promise of land. Now, isn't that nice? Let me tell you something, friends. I have title to a little piece of land here. My house sits on in Austin, Texas. It's not very big. It's outside of town. When I die, I don't want to see that land ever again. Well, wh what do you mean? What if God promised you that land? Let me tell you something, friends. God promised me a plot up in heaven. I don't even know how big it is. It may be a nothing. It may be a shack up there with no acreage at all. I don't care. I want to be there. The Jews want their land. They want Israel. They want that piece of dirt. They can have it. But I've got a promise. Do you have a promise? I was, I was born at the age of 16. Earth time. Earth time. I came to know Jesus at age 16. And I became free at the age of 16. I was in bondage until the age of 16. Maybe you were in bondage at the age of 30 or 40, or maybe you were 12 or 13. I don't know how old you were when you first came to Jesus Christ. That's when you became free. But all of your playmates or all your friends, they, if they didn't accept Jesus Christ, they, they were still in bondage, and they may be still in bondage today. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, it's written again, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than, thee, than she which hath a husband. The desolate are those that don't have Jesus Christ. They're desolate. They're on desolation row. Now we, brethren, ah, we get to the good part here. Now we, brethren, verse 28, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Hagar's son was was. After the flesh. But Isaac, Sarah's son, was the promise. And that's who our heir is. That's who, who we have the promise of. The same promise, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac. We're in a 
ancestral line were the lineage. You say, wait just a minute, I don't have any blood like that. I've had my DNA checked. I'm German or Scandinavian or English or Mexican or whatever. Listen to me. This blood will die on this earth and go back into the, the ground to dust. But you, your spirit, will be free if you know Jesus Christ. And it will have a new citizenship, Jerusalem, in heaven. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then, back in Abraham's time, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Even so it is now. Think about that. You see, he that's born after the flesh, who's in bondage to Satan, will always persecute Christians. Say, oh, no, that's not true. I know a good man. He's not a Christian. Mm-hmm. Just wait. He, 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 he'll persecute you as a Christian. He's got to. He can be a good man. You wait and see. There'll be things that come up. He doesn't have a heart that's free. He's not a citizen of heavenly Jerusalem. And Hagar is his mother. Sarah's your mother. Sarah. And who, who had Isaac. He that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Even so it is now. The Jews were, were, were persecuting the Christians. And I mean the Jews, the circumcised Jews who refused the name of Jesus Christ. They persecuted the Christians everywhere throughout the Roman Empire. They persecuted the Christians and demanded they be and, and, and thousands. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Thousands, millions of Christians were slain. Because of the, of, of the insistence of those who were in bondage to Satan. And they perse they were children of the flesh and they persecuted the children of the promise of the spirit. Nevertheless, verse 30 says, what saith the scripture? Even though you're being persecuted and Christians have been persecuted for some 2,000 years. Nevertheless, what does the scriptures say? Here's what it says, friends. Listen to this. It says, cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. That man in bondage to Satan, oh, he's got a big house, he's got a big car, he's got a, 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 a he drives around in, in the greatest of cars, and he has a yacht, and he has everything, and you're a nothing, you think. Wait just a minute. You live in a mobile home. You live in a, a small home. You, you, you're in an apartment. What, what, listen to me, friends. It's not what the outer trappings are. It's what's inside your heart. And you can have treasures, great treasures. What do the scriptures say? Cast out the bond woman with her son. That's what, that's, that's the end result of bondage to Satan. That's the end result of the Jews. The ones who Paul says are in Jerusalem to this day. And they're in bondage. The Jews are in bondage. So then, brethren, verse 31 says, We are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Listen to me, Arab. You know Jesus Christ is Lord? You have Sarah as your mother. Don't listen to them when they say, Oh, well, your mother's Hagar. Fleshly DNA doesn't mean anything. In fact, it means bondage. Are you born again of the promise of the Spirit? Are you an heir according to the promise given Abraham? You are if you know Jesus Christ. My friends, this is the two great divisions. This is, the, this is between the sheep and the goats. The goats are all who are of Hagar, the bondwoman. And Jerusalem is in that category, but the Jerusalem that is free, not the Jerusalem of the earth. Oh, oh, oh they're of the dragon. They're the, of Satan, the devil. But listen, you can be free. You can be a child of Sarah. That can be your heritage. That's the heritage of every Christian today. That's the meaning of Abraham and Sarah. It's an allegory. Now you understand the allegory. Because the allegory points out what the Holy Spirit instructs us. Hello, friends. Tex Mars here again. You know, a lot of people ask me, what Bible should I use? There's so many Bible versions today. Now, if you've been a member of Power of Prophecy long, you know that, well, 
I insist on the King James Version. Uh, it's the only Bible that I believe in. Now, you can get New Age Bible versions. It'll talk about these other Bible versions that are just New Age. They're occultic. Some of them, they, they leave off entire chapters and verses that are so important. You know, I have a good friend named Jack McElroy. He's a businessman. He asked himself that question. And he sought an answer, and he went out and he studied, evidently, for many years. And he ended up writing a book, and he sent me a copy of it and said, Text, you must read my book. This is very important. It's over 300 pages long, and I want to offer it to you today. I love this book by Jack McElroy. It's entitled, Which Bible Would Jesus Use? <laughs> now, there's a good question. Which Bible would Jesus use? The Bible version controversy explained and resolved. It says here, the subtitle. It's it's very insightful, and I'll, I'll tell you, you need this book. This is a great book for your library. Maybe you have friends that say, "Well, I you have the the New American Translation, or I use the Revised Standard Version, or I use the." And pretty soon they'll have the Revised, Revised, Revised Standard Version. You know, <laughs> and I know about all the contrary and whether they should put. You know, make God a woman. Some Bibles, you know, have God as a woman. And, oh, it's incredible. Just abominations. But the King James is God's word. And you'll find out why by reading this book. Which Bible would Jesus use? Hmm. Interesting. Now, I want you to have this book. It's over 300 pages long. Just $20. Add $5 shipping and handling by Jack McElroy. And boy, Jack does a great job on this book. As I said, he's a he's a very, very smart man. Uh, he was president of McElroy Electronics Corporation for over 35 years. And today he's president of several computer uh, corporations. He's got a, a degree from Lowell Technical Institute. And Jack is a man who said he found true happiness success, and fulfillment that he didn't have <laughs> once as a Roman Catholic, but he has now today. And he's found the true Bible. I want you to have this, my friends. Get Jack McElroy's book, Which Bible Would Jesus Use? For $20 plus $5 shipping and handling. $25. Send it, of course, here to Power of Prophecy, 1708 Patterson Road, Austin, Texas, 78733. Or go to our website. Go to powerofprophecy.com and ask for the book. You can use your charge card, of course. You can phone us, too. Toll free, 1-800-234-9673. Which Bible would Jesus use? By Jack McElroy. Order it today, my friends. Now, let's return to our regular program. We just covered the scripture where Abraham had two sons. <laughs> and uh, who are you related to? The son of Hagar or the son of Sarah? One of them was a free man, but one was a child of the flesh. One was in bondage, one was free. Okay, now let's talk about something. Did you know that you don't have a continuing city here on earth? Boy, this is a shocker to a lot of people. Oh, no, we have a continuing city. Jerusalem is a continuing city. Hmm. Well, I believe Jerusalem has had its time, my friends. And now it's up in heaven. The Jerusalem that was here on earth, well, it's done its time. It's over with. It's a desolation row kind of kingdom. You don't want to be affiliated with it. The Jerusalem that is of this earth is Sodom and Egypt, the Bible says. Read it in the book of Revelation. But but wait just a minute. I heard that Jerusalem is an, an eternal city. The Jews say we will be here forever and ever. We deserve this plot of land. It was given us by, by Abraham, by God. And it's ours and it will be for ours and we're going to kill over it. And we're going to kill all these Palestinians if we have to. We will have this land. And you must help us, Christian, because it's your biblical duty to give us Jerusalem. Say what? And there's this Muslim mosque right here, the mosque of Obor. We've got to tear it down and put up the great temple again. 
because this is God's holy city. Is that right? Is there a continuing holy city? Is there an eternal city? Or did God make every city on earth a blight? How about Rio de Janeiro? Isn't that a great city? They have a huge carnival every year. People gallivant around half naked and have sex on the streets and all kinds of things. Then there's New Orleans. Boy, don't they have fun there. They, everybody that, that throws a kiss gets some beads and women parade around there and get drunk and people listen to all that jazz music. And, oh, it's just fantastic. Then San Francisco, the city of the homosexuals. Then there's New York and then there's, 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 oh, it goes on and on, doesn't it? And in Israel today, they say that Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv declares we are the gay city of the world. Every year they have a great gay people celebration for the homosexuals. You want to be a gay man, gay woman? Go to Tel Aviv every year at their big gay celebration. That's what the world provides for you. But let me tell you something, my friends. Here we have no continuing city as Christians. As a person, as a child of God, you don't have a continuing city here. I'm going to prove it to you. Let's go. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. You see, in chapter 11, we hear all about faith. Faith. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not, not seen as yet, moved to build that ark, didn't he? By faith, Abraham... He looked for a city. Look at verse 10 there. Well, let's go to verse 9. It says, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise. It's Abraham. As in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. So Abraham had the promise of God. And, of course, Isaac and Jacob also, his sons, had the promise. Verse 10, now this gets to it, my friends. <laughs> for he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Hmm. Abraham looked for a city that had foundations. Not a, not a city that would be gone in a few years from now. It had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's the city that Abraham looked for. Verse 13 says, these all died in faith. All these great men and women of God died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that set, uh, say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. They were looking for a country. A country built by God, a, a country of God, had foundations of God. And truly, verse 15 says, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had the opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country. That is a heavenly, whereunto God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Hmm. Man. This is pretty powerful, my friends. Now, verse 22 of Hebrews 12, we hear about Christians. Now, remember, Noah, Abraham, all, all, Abel, all the great prophets and saints of God looked for a city in heaven. That's what they wanted. They didn't really want an earthly city. They wanted a heavenly city built by God whose foundations were sure. Now, what about us as Christians? Paul says, verse 22, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Well, verse 24 says, You have come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Hmm. Verse 28 says, wherefore we, now see, that's, you come to, to, to you, as a Christian, you didn't come to Washington, D.C., or to Jerusalem, that earthly city, or to Tokyo, or <laughs> Rio de Janeiro, or Buenos Aires. You came to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. 
Do you get that, friends? That's where you're a citizen of. Heavenly Jerusalem. The heavenly city. Verse 28 says, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Now think about that. You've received a kingdom. When you became a Christian, you received a kingdom. The kingdom of God. It has foundations. They can't be moved. They're sure. It's in heaven. It's in your heart too. It can't be moved. Satan can't move your kingdom. He can come in and destroy Washington, D.C. He can come in. Look, the, the, the Romans came and sacked Jerusalem in 70 A.D. They destroyed Jerusalem. Burn it to the ground. Every civilization has fallen eventually here on earth, but not heaven, not heavenly Jerusalem. <laughs> it can't be moved. It's sure. Boy. Chapter 13, verse 12 says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. He didn't even, he wasn't killed in Jerusalem. It was right outside Jerusalem. They kill him up on, on, on Mount Calvary. Read about Mount Calvary. It's outside the city limits, outside the gate. Verse 13 says, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp. That's outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here, now get this, friends. Oh, this is so mighty. For here we, for here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Oh my. Oh my. Jesus didn't come for Jerusalem. The greatest event of all time was when he died and was resurrected. <laughs> and where did that event occur? It didn't occur in Jerusalem. It was outside the city. Now, <laughs> think about that. And that's where we're going to have to go. Outside the city on earth. Outside the earthly environs. You can't, you can't find God's city here on earth. Even Jesus was resurrected outside the city of Jerusalem. Let us go forth then, outside the camp, outside the cities of the earth. Because, he says, for here have we no continuing city. Think about that, friends. I have so many Christian friends that say, well, I'm going to go visit Jerusalem. Before I die, I want to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. What? What? To that desolate city that hates Jesus Christ? He went there very unusually during his, his own life. He was born and, and he was raised in Galilee, the land of the Gentiles. It actually says it in the Bible. Galilee is called the land of the Gentiles. And his disciples told him, let's not go to Jerusalem. They'll kill us there. The Jews hate, hate us. They'll kill us. So that's where you want to go. That's where, the, today in the old city in Jerusalem, they say if a Christian has a Bible, the, an old Jew will walk up to him and spit him right in the face. That's what they think of you. That's not your city, friends. If you want to go there as a intellectual curiosity, that's okay. But I'd be just as happy in Madison, Wisconsin, or Toledo, Ohio. Myself, I've never been to Jerusalem, never want to go there. You see, I'm looking to a heavenly city. How about you, friends? Abel looked to a heavenly city. Noah looked to one. Abraham looked to one. <laughs> they didn't have any continuing city. Not on earth. And you don't have one either. <laughs> no, you don't. You have no continuing city here. All right. Now you see why the pastors of today don't want that verse to be known. They don't want you to know that you have no continuing city here on earth. They want you to think that Jerusalem is that great city. And oh, and we have to make sure that Israel's got that city. And it's an earthly city. And we, what? There is no city of God on this planet. Don't you know this planet's going to be destroyed? The apostle Peter says so. Read it in the book of Peter. This place is going to be destroyed by fire. There's going to be new heavens and a new earth. Remember that, friends. Now, let's talk about something else. 
when do you get to be in the kingdom? Now, there's a verse, a couple of verses that relate to this that are very important. You know, I met a pastor once and he gave me a book. He thought it was a very important book. He wanted to know, might you publish? Would you like to publish this book? He said, I know the author and he needs a, a publisher right now. It was published. It came out, went out of print. It was about the kingdom, the kingdom of God. I think that was the title of it. Big book, big thick book. I said, well, what does he say, pastor? Before I publish it, I need to know what the man preaches. Well, he's talking about the kingdom of God is coming. When Jesus returns again, the kingdom will be right here on this earth. Really? That's what he says in this book. Oh, yes, he does. He says the kingdom of God is coming. Is that what he said? Yes, that's what he says. That's what the pastor said. Well, I'm not going to have this book then. This is a heresy. He said, well, what do you mean heresy? You mean the kingdom of God's not here now? Well, no, it's not here now. Why, 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 why? this earth is uh, Satan's. This, he's God of this earth, small g. I said, is he your God? Well, no, Satan's not my God, the pastor said. Well, he's not my God either. It must be we have a different kingdom. I don't have this earth as my kingdom. <laughs> Neither did that Paul and the apostles, they didn't have this earth as their kingdom. This earth hated them. They all went to their deaths. Do you get that? <laughs> Read about what the lives of the apostles. Terrible things eventually happened to them. Even John, he was, at, at age 95, he was banished to the little island of Patmos. That's where he wrote, wrote his book. God will use anything that happens to you for good. That's where he wrote Revelation. 95 years old, banished to the island of Patmos. Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Romans. But there was the old John. <laughs> and that's where the angel visited him. That's where Jesus Christ came to him and said, write this down. Why, well, he could have come to John 20 years earlier. But it was in his perfect timing. Perfect timing. Now listen, my friends, I want you to understand something. As I told that pastor, I said, you're in the kingdom now. When Jesus accepted you into his kingdom, and he's got to accept you. You can want him all day long, but he's got to accept you. He's got to know your heart and know that you have faith in him. And that you will obey him as his servant. That's when he accepts you. It, it's not the moment you walk down the aisle you say, well, I'm going to walk down this aisle and accept Jesus. No, no, no. You may just be doing that so everybody in the church can see you. They can say, oh, well, he's one of us. But Jesus looks at the heart. He'll call you when he wants you. When you accept Jesus, when he calls on you and you believe in him, you have faith in him, you're in the kingdom. The kingdom of God is within you. That's what the Bible says. The kingdom of God is within you. Isn't that amazing? Let's go to Matthew 12, verses 25 through 28. And you'll see something amazing here. You see, Jesus was called a son of the devil by the Jews. They were just sure of themselves. Uh, verse 24 of Matthew 12 says, but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. They said, that gave, that's what gave Jesus his power. He was a Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Verse 25, and Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But, <laughs> listen to this, friends. But Jesus said, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Wow. 
Jesus said, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Wait now, the kingdom of God, that's up in heaven, isn't it? Isn't that where the kingdom of God is? And, and all this earth belongs to the devil? Well, Jesus said, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Let me, give, let me give you a little mystery of God, my friends. Let me reveal it to you right now. Wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the kingdom of God. Never forget that. You say, well, that's, I, I never heard that before. I've never had a pastor that told me that. Oh, listen to me. Wherever Jesus Christ is, there you will find the kingdom of God. Do you have Jesus in your heart? Then there is the kingdom of God. Oh, oh my. If, if you go to a church meeting and two or three are gathered in Jesus' name there, is, is the kingdom of God there in that church? Yes, it is. Mm. Verse 30 says, He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Hmm. He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. You've got to be with God. You've got to be with Jesus Christ. You've got to believe in faith that he is in your heart. Otherwise, you're just scattering everything. Everything. Nothing can be kept sacred. Nothing is, is treasured in your life. Now, let's look at Revelation 1, verse 9. I was just talking to you about Apostle John on the island of Patmos, where he was given the book of Revelation. Now, let's, let's talk about the kingdom here. This is, this is an amazing thing, too. Revelation 1 through 9. John says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto the servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed are he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you in peace. Okay, let's go. Verse 9. John writes, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, get that again. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. He's in the kingdom. But wait, he's in the island of Patmos. But wait, he's in the kingdom. <laughs> he's both. Of course, Jesus is in his heart. He, he's always ready to give out the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. He's in the kingdom. Hmm. Verse 10 says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. He was in the kingdom. People say, well, wait, he wasn't, he wasn't, he, he didn't die. When you die, you're going to go up to the kingdom of God. <laughs> when you have Jesus Christ in your heart, that's when you have the kingdom of God. Think about that. Now, let's go now to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. You know, there's so many, so many verses here. I'm just giving you just a few. Chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Verse 18. Let's, let's go to verse 18 of chapter 2. It says, For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, ye are, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, 
Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. That's it, folks. You're in the kingdom of God. And, and, and you're, you're put together there by God. You're like a building. God has built you. You're one of the living stones. And he's put all the stones together. And together, you are a holy temple in the Lord. You see, the Jews say, we're going to rebuild the temple of God that was destroyed by the Romans. They can't do that. They can't. The temple of God is his people, the lively stones that are Framed together and they fit perfectly. Hmm. For a habitation of God. You see, God is, is within you. A habitation of God through the Spirit. Did you, did you know that when you read the Word of God, God acts somehow supernaturally within you? It's amazing. When you pray to God, God inhabits your words of prayer. That's what the Old Testament says. These are, these are supernatural things. You, a man cannot understand them uh, uh, greatly, but God will reveal them all to you someday. But when you pray to God, God inhabits your prayers. Well, that means you want to pray a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> you want God to be with you. He will inhabit your prayers. That's, I believe, in the book of Habakkuk. That's an amazing thing. You're not just praying into the air. God comes down and he's inside your prayers. That means it's mighty, my friends. You can bring down strongholds of Satan by, by praying. Now, so let's just face it, folks. You have Jesus, you have the kingdom of God. That's, that's one of the greatest mysteries of all times. I didn't want that book, that book that talked about someday Christians, when they die, they're going to go to the kingdom. That's, that's telling it's far off. You see, you you have the kingdom now. The, the, the Jesus Christ came, died on the cross. The blood of Christ, he, he's given you the kingdom. You have the keys of the kingdom. That's why you can accomplish miracles on this planet. That's why Satan cannot defeat you. You're not in his kingdom. You're in God's kingdom. Think about that. There are two kingdoms on this planet, Satan's and God's. And which is superior? You know it is. God's. That's why Satan hasn't been able to destroy this ministry. He hasn't been able to take down power of prophecy. He can send everybody he wants to. He can send the, the gates of hell against me. They're not going to stand up because I am of the kingdom of God. I'm right here on earth. I'm in the flesh, but I'm not of the flesh. Well, folks, we've covered three of the ten scriptures. We've, we've looked at Abraham's two sons. We've looked at the fact that we have no continuing city. And we look to the fact that we're in the kingdom. We're in the glorious kingdom whenever Jesus Christ comes in our hearts. Well, next week we're going to talk about the seed. The seed. And what is Jesus for him today? Is he a, a, a Jewish man in heaven? Hmm. And but if you're a sinner, will God hear your prayers? Some people say he doesn't listen to sinners' prayers. We're going to talk about that. Give you some verses on that next week. Hmm. I've got so much more. So much more. So please tune in each week during this same time and discover the power of prophecy.